Okay, gentlemen. Well, good to see you. Um, my name is Justin Erickson. I'm a pastor of adult ministries at Calvary Bible Church here in Burbank, uh, just in the backyard here. And uh, Stuart Scott asked me to come and to just share with you what uh, God's been doing in my life with regard to the counseling training that I received when I was here. I see a number of very familiar faces, so it's good to see a, a lot of you. Anyway, I wanted to uh, um, just spend some time with you and let you interact. And, and just to identify with you men, I sat in the same seat you're in uh, a few years ago and I've had the opportunity to sit under people like Dr. Scott and, and Dr. Wayne Mack and, and others at the, at the college and the Masters of Biblical Counseling. And just want you to know that uh, um, you are in the right place and, and God is so glorified by the practical theology that you're learning in these classes and, and the ability to take that. But um, I wanted to come and just share different things. Stuart asked me to share different lessons that I've learned uh, for what it's worth and different benefits that I've been able to find in ministry. And before I did that, I thought maybe we would uh, sanctify the hour by uh, seeking the Lord and praying and then committing the time to him. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege that is ours to be here this afternoon. Thank you for your word and the all-sufficient grace given to us by the Spirit of God. I pray that as we enjoy our time here today talking about your word, that we would think deeply and practically about the issues that face our people. You tell us to shepherd them, and the mark of our faithfulness is the ability to implement the word of God in their lives so that they live according to your statutes. We want to pray that our time here this afternoon would be profitable, that we would have a, a good time interacting together, and Lord, you would continue to strengthen each one of these students as they are progressing towards graduation. I know most of them are, are going to be walking this May, and I just would beseech you that you would uh, give them the extra grace that they need, the energy and the strength to persevere and to endure and to make wise ministry decisions as they come down the road. We love you and we affirm your lordship this afternoon and your right to rule as Lord in our lives, and we love you, and thank you for this time, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it was fresh out of seminary that I got a, a phone call from a woman who wanted to stop in and see me, and she was working on the Drew Carey show, and she was working with a woman who was a believer, and that woman had come to her for counsel, and she wasn't sure how to direct her, and uh, so she came to me. And she said, basically, this woman told her that, uh, that her husband of seven years, for the last three to five years, she wasn't sure, had been taking estrogen hormones and had been preparing and planning for a surgery that was going to come up where Ray would become Rachel. And this woman, who was a believer, married this man, knowing that he had some of these inclinations and hoped to be a help, and now was faced with the reality that he was about to enter into emasculating himself and had no idea what to do. Now, the kicker with this is the guy knew enough of the Bible to say, well, I haven't been with anyone. I'm, I've not slept with another person. Um, I haven't committed adultery, and so therefore you can't divorce me. And I want to live with you, and the Bible says that you can't leave me in, uh, unless I'm, if I'm willing to stay with you. And if you try it, I'll kill myself. And she says, so what do you think? I said, well, you know, Dr. Thomas has a view. I'm not, no, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> You know, that, that was a real life scenario, fresh out of seminary. I'm confronted with this woman who says, uh, you know, what do I tell my coworker? Uh, you know, and the issues you could imagine were, that came up were, uh, okay, well, if he emasculates himself, is he still a man in God's eyes? And it fails to become uh, a lesbian relationship because the man is really a man. And, and yet if he is, if it's not a lesbian relationship, then how does she fulfill her conjugal responsibilities to her, to her husband? And, and he is willing to live. And so what about that clause? And, and does God justify uh, a divorce in those cases? And uh, so this was a tough issue. And I said, so do nothing right now and let me call Dr. Stuart Scott and I'll tell you what to do. And so I called him and he's, <laughs> I put the pressure on him uh, to answer that. And by the way, get his email, get his phone number, uh, 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 find out where he likes to go to lunch and take him out. That will be one of the most helpful things that will save your ministry. Um, we sat down and, and looked at the scriptures together. And I'm just curious, what would you guys, uh, what were some of the things that you might uh, do or consider in that case? He was unwilling to discuss. Uh, if she can explain to him that marriage is between man and woman. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the comment was explained to him that, that the uh, marriage is between a man and a woman, which he, which he learned and understood. He's very well versed in the Bible and, and would have a very egalitarian view of the Bible that would allow him to justify certain texts 
Um, so he would find, he would escape the confrontation of the scripture that way. He's abandoned her. Okay, he... Okay, he's abandoned her. Now, that, that's, that's, that's the trail we went down. In fact, Dr. Mack showed me a verse in, a, in Exodus 18, I think it was, where if uh, a man failed to fulfill his conjugal responsibilities to his wife, he had to give her a certificate of divorce. So he had abandoned her, and on grounds, on the scriptural grounds, she could remove herself, even though he wanted at that point to stay. He had already abandoned her or was taking steps to finalize that process. What we did when we probed a little deeper was found out that he had also moved out because of the stress in the home that, that, that his decision had caused. Um, and so in another case, he had abandoned her as well. So there was grounds in that case. What, what else might you uh, uh, ask or address when you were confronted with something like that? Where's she, yeah, she at with the Lord? Uh, uh, why, why would you ask that? I'm just curious. No, oh, right. Mm-hmm. That, that's the key. She's coming in with this scenario, and, and I can't change him, and only the work of the Spirit of God in his life can change him, but I can help her respond in a God-honoring, righteous way, the sovereign God who ordained that her husband would, uh, she would marry a man who would do this. Um, she could still reflect the love of Christ to him, be a witness, um, et cetera. Yeah, that's good. What else? What other thoughts do you, would you probe? What are, what are your thoughts about his desire to kill himself? Do you have a comment? I was just going to say, he, to explain to her that he's thinking of everything very narrowly, mm-hmm. whereas to explain the breadth of the, those commands, uh, and not just to try and sneak through a... Mm. Yeah, show him that he's there. trying to get through a loophole. Yeah, that's good. That's real good. And, and had he been willing to come to counseling, we could have done that. Right, we would have tried to draw him into the counseling office. and, and uh, oh, Just curious, what, post-surgery, let's say he wants to repent. Let's say he repents. He went through with it, by the way. He now goes to the women's restrooms. Uh, he, he does everything that a woman does, I guess. Um, what, what, what would you think of repentance look like? <laughs> How do you restore that? Don't be specific. I mean, yeah. Well, repentance is a hard issue. Yeah, right. It's not going to be about his physical scarring. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, wh- whatever, his heart has to be engaged, right? No matter what happens to him bodily, he still has to make appropriate restitution uh, to her for the sin that he's brought into their home. That's good. That's very good. What else might you uh, say or ask about that scenario? I'm just curious. <laughs> Check me out. Well, one of the other things that we did is we, we looked a little bit more deeply into the word porneia that Jesus used in Matthew 19. Uh, the, except for the case of porneia. And, and we had asked the question, is his behavior, albeit isolated to himself, deviant enough sexually where he could move out of uh, the realm of porneia and justify adultery? And in that case, we believe that he had done that, uh, that God had not honored his change of his gender. And uh, we gave her the green light to, if she would, um, if she wanted that, that was an option she could pursue and that we would support her in doing that. <sighs> So then, I sit across the desk with a woman in my office who we had to publicly discipline recently for uh, a belief in ancient Gnosticism. Now, you read Gnosticism in your theology classes and you think it's in first century stuff, and I did too until a few months ago, when this woman articulated to me um, her belief in, um, well, what had happened is, is she had moved in with a woman who was involved in the occult. And this woman, she didn't, when she slept maybe three, four hours a night uh, on her lunch break and for dinner. She's a single gal. She read all kinds of books, all kinds of things that, um, uh, you know, just undiscerningly, whatever somebody gave her and said, this is a good book, she'd walk down to your normal fluffy Christian bookstore and buy just, you know, the bestsellers and read them. And that's what she believed, you know. She had a wet finger to the wind, whatever uh, direction the theological wind was blowing, she was going that way too. And so she sits down and, and with one of the ladies in our ministry who says, I'm kind of concerned about some of these things that the women, woman believes. And uh, so she brings the woman in and we begin to talk and dialogue and she begins to disseminate pagan ancient Gnosticism. Although she didn't call it that and she couldn't say Gnosticism, what she told us basically was that God, uh, the mother, is the one who brings us the divine grace that we need to arrive at higher Christ consciousness so that we attain spiritual perfection, including harnessing the energy from the stars and from the angels uh, to be able to, to let the fullness of, of our own divinity unfold within us. And I'm sitting there going, didn't we go over this in NTI? You know, did we cover this before? And, and so I began to ask questions. And I began to say, okay, so, so tell me, um, 
you know, uh, tell me some of the things that you experience. And she says, well, I see light. I said, you see light? And she said, yeah, in fact, um, I see it now. I said, well, what cover is it? She says, it's red. I said, really? I said, well, well what, can you kind of describe it? She goes, yeah, it's coming out from my temple. And I said, oh, you mean that little dented part in, in, in your head? She goes, yeah. I said, well, now, and I, I took her back to the scripture and told her that she needed to examine every experience in light of the scripture. And she said, well, yeah, I've done that. In fact, the Old Testament, did you know that God's light filled the temple? And she was dead serious. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. And she says, furthermore, God is light. I said, mm-hmm, but that's not what that means. And, um, and she said to me, well, um, you see, God being light means that God is not dense, that God is, 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 is not heavy. And, and who God is, the, the, the more we begin to remove ourselves from the dense things of life and we separate ourselves from the things of the world, we achieve a higher fullness of knowledge of God. And I thought, this is Gnosticism. And I'm talking to this lady, and I'm thinking, where am I going to go? Well, what I find out is that she went to a conference from a woman named Shalanda Saima, a, a Hindu guru who uh, imports the teachings of Jesus into her Hinduism to create an amalgam form of, of Hinduism. She's a, a, a Devi, a self-proclaimed mother goddess, just bizarre stuff. And, and, and so the conversation's going on, and, and, and she says, well, I want you to know I also see things. I thought, oh. What? What do you see? She goes, she says, um, I see angels. Right now? Right now. Where are they? Behind you? What are they doing? <laughs> just floating there. I said, you mean they're kind of levitating? She goes, yeah, they're just kind of like a helicopter, just still levitating over you. I said, well, are they male, female? And they said, uh, neither. I said, well, what, 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 they have a color, shape, appearance, blue. And she said, they're, they're like these energy waves that just wiggle like this in the air, and, and I know that they're angels and they're always with me. Really? I said, do you see anything else? Any good angels, any bad angels? Tell me which one I'm, I'm sitting by. And she said, well, I also have visits from spirits that are departed that tell me what happened on earth, and, and I actually communicate their messages and take those messages to uh, people um, uh, who are still living. For example, I knew nothing about a traffic accident. I had this spirit in this wavelength energy thing come and visit me and, um, and tell me all of how it happened and tell them everything is okay, they're in a better place, and, and they wanted me to communicate that. And so we said, so you're channeling for demons. No, 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 no. I, and, and what happened was just this, we had to go after uh, this issue and, and we ended up writing a, a critique on what Gnosticism is and showing the parallels between her and uh, what this uh, uh, Devi Hebrew or uh, uh, Hindu goddess was teaching and uh, called her out from it. Now, what, what, what do you do in that case? What, what do you think would be the appropriate line of counseling? Or what, or what would be your interpretation? It's one of the eight eyes. How would you interpret that? Just give it a shot. What do you think? I mean, this is real stuff. I'm thinking, well, did, did we go over this in Philippians? We didn't go over this in Philippians. She, to be a believer. she could articulate the gospel with precision. Total precision. Well, what other kinds of questions might you ask? There seems to be that confusion about God. I mean, she has false beliefs about who God is. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a fundamental problem. Okay, she's got a problem with her view of God. That's absolutely right. Which God is she talking about? When she talks about God, she talks about the God who is the spirit who is also the mother, mother goddess unfolding the Christ consciousness within you, your Christ. What else might you ask, or what might you conclude? She doesn't know Christ. Okay, she doesn't know Christ. Yeah. Why would you say that? Well, her knowledge, or what, you know, her, her theology proper is, is all askew. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. The first thing about the gospel is, is you believe the God of the scriptures and that you are uh, uh, accountable to him. Absolutely. Not to a goddess or a mm -hmm. Christ consciousness. So she's not a believer, so you treat her like a pagan. That's exactly right. Uh, not a believer. Her view of God and her view of scripture, all skewed. All skewed. In fact, the, the Jesus that she was speaking of wasn't the Jesus of scripture. It's just like the Mormon Jesus. He's not the true Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible is not the one who unfolds in you so that you become divine. Uh, and they would go to passages that, that, that we would look at um, that counter Gnosticism as proof texts. You know, and, and she would do that. 
What, what else might you do? It, let, let, let's say that she was a believer or, or that you thought she might be a believer. I mean, you're concerned that maybe she's in error. She's gone and listened to this Hebrew goddess. She's totally non-discerning. She has no hermeneutic stability. And she comes to you and she says, and this is what she said to me. You know what, you know what? Because I was coming after her because I felt she was in false teaching. And I said, uh, um, you know, I'm really concerned about that. And she said, okay, okay, well, just tell me what to believe. What, what, what do you do with that? What do you think? This is real stuff. Take her to the scriptures. Okay, take her to the scriptures. And what would you do when you got there? So explain how, how her beliefs are unscriptural. Okay, all right. And, and, and teach her the truth and... Mm -hmm. Rest upon the Spirit of God to work in your heart. Now, and, 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 and prefacing that that's what I'm going to do, I did that. And I said, okay, we're going to do this. Um, I want to look at a few scriptures with you and, and just tell you that I'm alarmed that what you're believing is, an, is another gospel. But here I, I know she's undiscerning and I want to talk to her and work with her. And so as I, as I sit there and interact with her, I'm thinking, well, it's very possible she's not saved. But what if she is a believer? Well, um, it'll show up in her teachability. And so I said, okay, and she, she says to me, you know what, I, I want to learn from you, I, I just want to understand, I, I hope I didn't do anything wrong, I'm sorry, I'll just leave. No, 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 don't, don't go anywhere, stay right there. And, um, and so we, we began to work with her and, and talk to her uh, uh, just about the issues and, and whatnot, and then she became extremely hostile. I mean, we would just talk about the issues, and, and we began to say, okay, here's what the Bible teaches. And what would happen is she would defend this guru, no matter what this guru said, she would defend it. And uh, so that you, this is more of a doctrinal theological issue at this point, but it's still a counseling scenario. And the expectation I had in my mind is John 10, if she's truly one of Christ's sheep, then what? She'll hear the shepherd's voice and come out of her error. And so I thought, I have to do my best to disseminate the voice of the shepherd so that she would come out of the error and recant it and turn from it, which she refused to do. In fact, I sat there a number of times and thought, I thought, you know, if she's not a believer, then what might be your suspicion? demon. I felt like I talked, you know what, guys, I'm not typically mystical. I'm not afraid of the boogeyman, but I thought probably I encountered four demons that night. I had four different personalities coming at me. And I thought, whoa. It, it, it was everything from a, a visible face change to a hard, deep, sullen countenance with just this, this venom with the perfect ability to articulate the things I could, I could, I mean, she could quote paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs that I was watching on the internet. She was reciting. I thought, I'm talking to demons. And I got this one cornered, now another one just kicked in. And I'm thinking, man, okay, share the gospel again. You get to the gospel. And we had to deal with these issues, and what's worse is she, her, her influence now, she came to something for you know, some counseling issues, uh, and now it's a discipline scenario, and we had to actually move to warn the church against her. Uh, she failed to become a member of the church because she knew that if she was a member, she would be accountable for her teaching. And so we had to warn the church according to Acts 20 that men or women will arise from among yourself speaking perverse things. And so we had, to, we had to shepherd our congregation to be discerning in that. And so that's just a kind of a sampling of, of, of some of the stuff that I sat in your seat and thought, I, I never saw this coming down the pike, these kinds of things. And I thought, um, I, I was grateful to the Lord for the things that throughout the course of counseling or throughout the, my training in seminary, uh, felt the ability to, to be able to deal with and with, a, with a healthy sense of dependence on God. And, and I understand what it's like to be in your place. And I understand what it's like to have exegesis coming down, uh, cramming down your throat. I understand what it's like to have deadlines and books and, and some professors think that your class is, you know, their class is the only class and they're going to give you 30,000 pages of reading, you know, by next Friday. I f I've felt that and been there. But if there's one area that I feel like I would have uh, done better and tried to do better when I came to this understanding was developing my practical theology. Developing who I would be as a man of God and then hopefully out of the overflow give to other people in the area of counseling. And I want to I let you know I, I'm... Um, one of the things I did when I was in counseling is burned a number of electives in the MABC course, uh, the MABC curriculum over at, uh, at the college, which was wonderfully enriching. And uh, I, I took exegesis courses, but I felt like I had a balanced diet with my, uh, uh, with my stuff. And I actually ended up pursuing the master's degree at counseling out there uh, at the college. I'm about seven units away. I got to write a thesis, and I'm not sure what to pick yet, but I got some scenarios I can use, some case studies. But, you know, Stuart asked me to come, and I thought of maybe a number of lessons that I've, that I've learned. And for what they're worth, I thought maybe I would give these to you. I don't know if you'll encounter these. Uh, they're from our own personal experience here at our ministry. Like I said, we're here in Burbank, which is sort of a hub 
the stuff that goes on doesn't go on in Hollywood anymore. It largely goes on in Burbank, and so we're in the middle in a lot of ways of Corinth. Uh, Brody back there in the back was one of our interns. He knows all about that, and he sees this on a day-in and day-out basis. But, but let me give you some of the benefits, I believe, and some of the lessons that, that uh, I've gleaned, and just sitting where you are would encourage you, brothers, if it's, if it's worth your while to consider. The first thing was that biblical preaching stimulates counseling. I think if you are truly an expositor, that you will, if you're truly using your, your exposition uh, for the sake of, of bringing the truth to bear in the lives of the people, you are going to unearth issues in the lives that need to now be dealt with with more personal, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, uh, a ministry of the word. I think sometimes we, we may lose the mindset, especially in circles like ours, that, that preaching is such a strong emphasis, and brothers, you need to preach with all your heart. It's my favorite aspect of ministry. But to have a balance in ministry like Paul did in Acts 20.20 20, where, where he, and I call it a 2020 vision for ministry, I'll just read it to you. He says, uh, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. That there was a, there was a very public and formal nature to his ministry and there was a very private and informal nature to his ministry. And, and what you end up getting in the area of counseling is that more private nature uh, of counseling, the more specialized needs that people in the body have that you're preaching, if you're preaching the word, men, will stir up. And likewise, the advantage of being able to engage and intersect with your people um, creates a wonderful opportunity uh, to be able to know how to preach and how to make application. It's often said that, that it's up to the Holy Spirit uh, uh, to do the application in our preaching, and that's true. But the Spirit of God um, works through the word and the only ministry of the word is, is not preaching. That is a primary one for sure. But there are many, uh, many avenues of the ministry of the word. Preaching is not a cul-de-sac. It's, it's an avenue that leads to all the different directions of ministry of the word. And I believe that counseling is one of those main streets. Some guys will uh, stand on their own five-yard line and hurl a Hail, Hail Mary sermon, hoping that somebody in the congregation runs under it. And that's, that's poor shepherding. And we've been able to see the benefit of that kind of counseling in our own lives. It helps us know where our people are at. For example, uh, and this is another lesson that we learned, never assume that people are saved. We came to Calvary and, and the thing that we began to learn uh, when we entered into counseling, and, and, and even the things we were talking about here, is if you're concerned that a person is not a believer, go there. Ask their testimony, find out. I mean, part of your data gathering, figure out where they're at with their walk with the Lord. That's, that's essential. And, and so some people would say, you know, it's kind of... You seem to be hitting brick walls here. Could it be? I don't know. Have you ever thought about this? I mean, I know you've been in the church all your life. I know you've, you've, you can quote a lot of the Bible, but could it be that maybe you don't know Christ and the reason for the struggle that you're having is, is maybe that your heart's not entangled with the world, but your heart is, is, is spiritually flatlined. And probably 90% of the issues we dealt with in the first year were all unbelievers. We, we led more people to Christ in our counseling office than we did in any sermon or in, you know, whatever. Um, that, was, uh, that was essential. So we never assume people are saved, even if they've been in the church all their life, that as we get into their, their lives and we try to unpack the issues, we're saying, why are we, why are we colliding here? Why is it that they have such a, a strong, um, um, they, they, they seem to want to apply this stuff and they've been in the church and they've identified on an external moral level, but they're having a problem changing and it's because they don't know Christ. And so we never take anybody for granted. I think the, uh, a third thing maybe that's been a lesson for us, it's also a benefit, is to realize that the Bible is absolutely sufficient. I mean, I know that we believe that, but to actually have a front row seat to people watching the grace of God change their lives. I, I, I did some, I did some uh, uh, fa figuring fact stuff when our first year, 95%, well, for the first seven months, nobody ever brought their Bible to counseling. Ever. The first time. Ever. And, and they were actually shocked that we would open it. And, and, and the statement that always came back is, well, we, we're just here to get your opinion. How would you answer that? Yeah, uh, yeah my opinion is irrelevant. You need God's mind on this. That's exactly right. And uh, that's what we would do is open the word of God and take them to those passages that show, like Second Peter 1, that the scriptures are sufficient to deal with their life issues and, and just to watch people's lives change. We've, we've seen people uh, 20 years on medication to deal with spiritual problems come in and in the course of several months come to me and say, you know what? After, after spending time with God and his word and watching him work through our time together, I think that maybe I've been going to the psychiatrist for my problem wrongly, what do you think? 
I mean, what, what do you think about this? And I, I'm always careful never to give them medical advice about, their, about the, you know, the pills that they're taking, uh, but I'll often then have the psychology talk with them. Uh, we just had the psychology talk with our church about, what was it, Brody, maybe a month ago? Uh, the elders asked for us to define our position on psychology and, and granted this church where we were at, the interim guy, uh, before we ended up getting there, uh, uh, would preach 15 minute sermons and he told, he told the elders that the way he prepared for sermons, and he would tell the congregation this, the way he prepared for sermons was pouring over psychological journals all week and then finding a verse that would sort of let him launch into that. And so to come three years later and to be able to have a biblical stand, here is what we believe and here is our position about the scriptures and their authority and their sufficiency in your life and here is what the truth is about psychology. We were able to do that in a three-part series uh, that we did for our church, uh, a series of papers that ensued, uh, 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 Q&As that happened. That just unearthed, I mean, you had no idea. We had no idea the people in our church that were just going to psychiatrists. 95% of them, I did, I did some research, 95% of them, the people we counseled in the first year, had ongoing long-term psychological or psychiatric counseling. And they came and they said, our lives have just been changed in the short couple of months. It's been hard as we've been trying to turn around these, these patterns we've developed, but, but the word of God has changed us. And you watch them, they bring their Bibles to counseling now. They're tell me what God says. And it's encouraging to watch God's grace be sufficient as opposed to secular ideas that require no spirit, no Jesus, no Bible in order to change. Uh, another lesson that we learned is that people need help implementing scripture. Even if we're practical in our preaching, and even if we try to make application in our preaching, we realize that there's a difference between application and implementation. Implementation, what, what would you say the difference is? The difference between implementing and applying. Knowing what to do and then actually doing it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. In application, you know what you should do. Implementation is taking the steps to get you there. And most of our people would go home and actually convicted over the sermons, and they'd be like, Okay, we're going home and we're trying to repent. But you know what? Specifically, I know I need to repent of this sin. I know that I've been bitter towards my husband, but what do I do about that? I mean, what are some practical ways that I could put off bitterness and put on uh, tenderheartedness towards my husband? What are some tangible ways? That, and I find that people really, that is so helpful for them to know. And there's no way in the pulpit you could make every implementation and even though you're trying to be as practical as a shepherd as you can in the pulpit, counseling then opens, is opened up and, and you have the opportunity to help people actually implement the scriptures and get to watch people change. I think it's 3 John that says it's no greater the joy than to see my children walking in the truth. You can't do that if you just hurl a, a pass at them and hope they run under it. Another lesson, counseling is hard work. <laughs> I don't need to tell you this. I think you know this if you're going to do it right. I, I, I saw a picture one time. It was a little sarcastic, but it was a picture of a, I should have brought it, one-time counseling sessions. There was a counselor standing over the counsel. He just <laughs> pop him in the mouth and snap out of it was the mindset. And sometimes we have a, uh, may have and may flirt with that tendency at times because it's such hard work to just tell people, will you snap out of this? Will you stop it rather than actually walking with them and shepherding them like a shepherd uh, does his sheep? But it's intense. I, I don't know about you, but more intense than actually preaching a sermon. I sit there just trying to listen to and follow and interact with somebody. I come home. If I have like two or three in that day, I am so wiped. I come, honey, I love you. I'm taking a nap. I got to go to bed. It is so intense. And counseling can be effective. It's kind of like a farmer, how he uses manure. You can spread it out. Uh, and if you spread it out, it, it's very effective. If you clump it together, it stinks. And I found that uh, in, in our counseling that we um, have had to learn to spread our counseling out. Some of you are just getting that. Um, I think that uh, I think counseling is very hard work if you're going to do it right. And it's going to require a lot of time and a lot of commitment on your part, a lot of preparation and study, a lot of prayer and diligence, a lot of thank you card writing, a lot of I'm praying for you, a lot of faithfulness in praying and saying, you know what, I'm going to be praying for you when, when your wife is gone these next two weeks that you'll be pure. Because I know about your struggles on the internet. And I want to help you. Those kinds of things. Uh, there was a point there, and this is, this is a word of the wise that I would uh, add to that too, is make sure that everybody shares the load. Uh, we, I, reached a, I reached a bottleneck with this uh, a few months ago. I had, I'm usually at about max capacity doing 60% of my time devoted to counseling if I'm at about six or seven cases. I was up to 13. And I just said, you know, I, I, you guys got to take the load. You know, Brody, you got to take it, man. You are it. And so, Brody, when you get back to the office today, you and I need to talk. I got one for you. 
But the, uh, the issue is it, it really is hard work and, and, and it's easy to become cynical about people. It's easy to become calloused if you're not careful in devoting your time to prayer for them and really wanting to give your life as Paul told the Thessalonians he wanted to do. Those are lessons that I've learned that have just been helpful, that it's hard work, but, but it's, a, it's a ministry of the word. Another lesson we've learned is how to guard against black holes. You know what that is? That's, that's somebody who comes in and they absorb all your time, take all your resources, then leave. That's really hard to do. You, and one of the ways that we, well, we've tried to prevent that. What, what would you think would be a way that you maybe would try to prevent somebody being a black hole in your ministry that just sucks all your time from you? Okay, limit the time of the appointments. What would you say is a good length of time? Probably vary by the person. Yeah, what, what do you think in your capacity? Not more than an hour. How long before, in a class before you need a break? An About an hour. What have you found, Stuart? Hour, hour and a half, that's what I found too. Hour and a half seems to be just right for me. Seems to be just right for them. If I have these mar- marathon counseling sessions, it just, it just doesn't work. You can't, you can't cram an elephant into a thimble. And sometimes people are dealing with real elephants in their lives and, and all you have is that little thimble. That's their, that's their understanding. Well, what else might you do to guard against a black hole? Just give them some assignments to do before they come back. Yeah, that's good. Why would you do that? Give them assignments. Because if they're really interested in changing, they're going to pursue these things before they come back. That's great. If they really want to change, they'll pursue that. So if they don't do their homework, what does that tell you? A black hole. They're a black hole. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, the long on Star Wars or something. Uh, if they're not willing to do the work, then they're looking at you as what? How are they viewing you? What is it? Fix it. A fix it, yeah. I, I would even say a surrogate Christ. Uh, most people are so attuned to looking at psychologists as the person I just come and dump on and, and that's it. And, and actually, they, I find that they look towards counselors sort of as a surrogate Christ. You're my, my, my Christ. And, and, and certainly, we want to point them to Christ and even at times spiritually carry and piggyback them in their, when they're weak. But, but that's true, yeah. I'm just wondering, do you limit the amount of counseling you do from outside of your church or your own block? Great, yeah, the, the great, great point. Yeah, we do limit uh, the amount of counseling we do outside our church. I got a call this week from a woman that says, listen, we go to a church in our area. It's kind of liberal. We have some friends that we met that have worked with you, and we have the exact same issues. Our pastors are unwilling to, to, to provide biblical counsel. In fact, it's just fallen through the cracks uh, with us. In fact, it's an issue where my husband is, and what she described is probably a non-believer. The issue is adultery. It's like, Okay, this may be a discipline scenario. Um, are we willing to take that on uh, and willing to help them? Well, the first thing I do is look at my calendar and see if I can. Uh, second thing is I, I maybe talk to the guys, but, but primarily the, the deal breaker for me is whether or not the eldership and the leadership at that church is willing uh, uh, to support that. Because by virtue of their membership, they've placed themselves under the authority of that church, and we don't want to circumvent that. And so what we tell them is, well, why don't you go back and appeal to your leaders to deal with this biblically. And maybe here's some verses that I would encourage you to take back with him. Do it in humility, do it in gentleness, come as a learner, realize you still honor them and submit to them. And if they're unwilling to implement the scriptures, then you have to make a decision whether or not to remove yourself from their leadership. And if you do, then, then give me a call back and we'll do that. Otherwise, um, if they would be willing, one of their pastors would be willing to come, or one older man or older woman who's in their lives that has the ability to help enforce accountability to our counseling, then uh, bring them. Uh, and we'll do that. And so that, that's a great question, but, but it's, it's our members get the first priority, regular attenders get our second priority, and then outside get our third priority. And, and the line usually is pretty long for, for our counseling, and so sometimes we have to just say, you know, um, it'd be a lot easier if you were a member here. So a great question, yeah, that's a very, very good insight. Uh, other question about that, it's good. Good. Um, uh, maybe related to that, counseling women is something to guard against. Uh, each guy has their own policy. I know Dr. Mack doesn't counsel any woman without his wife there. Um, what's your policy, Stuart? I know you leave the door open, is that right? Yeah, I'll meet once or twice mm-hmm. to get what's going on and then I'm thinking of which godly woman I want to be. Mm-hmm. Titus 2 type. Okay. Yeah, yeah which game, that, that's, that's what we do at ours. We'll meet with them a couple times, fix them with an older woman in the life of the body that will plug them in that hopefully can amalgamate them back into the life of the body of our church. That's what we do too. Um, I had a woman first week there come in. She had problems with her husband, uh, a lot of issues, and she's just a normal woman. Um, really encouraged by our time, came back next week smelling and looking really good. Really friendly. Hey, Pastor. I said, hey, we're done. 
I just terminated counseling right there. We're, we're done. We're done. And, and I know Jay Adams has done a number of different things. He said women, you know, make passes or advances at him. He actually pick up the phone and call his secretary, get in here right now and explain what happened and this woman and, and uh, we're going to get you the help, but not this way. And so yeah, the, the, one way you can limit your counseling is by uh, uh, developing faithful people within your ministry who can, who can help shoulder that load as well. So those are, those are some things that I would, I would commend to you men just for your own encouragement and for the sake of your ministry. Stuart asked me if I uh, um, want to take a couple minutes for any other questions that you might have. Is there anything that, that you want to know this side of the, of the platform, counseling and what it's like? I'm no expert for sure. You got the expert as your teacher, but perhaps there's things that maybe I would identify with fresh out of seminary. Anything at all? Great. All right. Yeah. Okay. How about um, you know that First Thessalonians five fourteen where you discern what kind of person they are? Mm-hmm. That's good. Uh, how long do you take usually to determine what type of person they are if they're teachable or not? Like you mentioned the the, the Gnostic woman. Mm-hmm. Sure. How long, how long would you give a person to? That's great. The, the passage he's referring to in 1 Thessalonians 5 says, uh, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, and help the weak, but be patient with all men. And, and the question is, how do you discern what person they are? Because, uh, and I'm so glad you asked that, because if you have an unruly person, a person who's just totally out of control, totally undisciplined, totally unwilling to bring themselves under, you admonish them, you come down on them, you warn them. Um, you, the, the faint-hearted person is a, is a small-souled person. They're, they're beginning to shrivel. They're beginning to pull back. Uh, they need a Barnabas to come alongside them, not come down on them. And then you have a person who's weak, who's drowning. Uh, and, and they need someone to come and bear them up, but in all cases, to be patient with them. How long does it take to discern? It, it's really a case-by-case scenario. I can find out usually pretty quick. Most often, it's, it's somebody who's in the latter two. Uh, it, it's an issue of either they're either really, really discouraged and they're weighed down by a trial in their life. That's probably the most common counseling thing that's come into my office. Past traumas that they're trying to deal with uh, or issues in their life they don't know how to face and they want biblical direction on. And usually uh, the way I try to figure that out is however long it takes for me to gather data about them. And I, I do that at the beginning. I take a long time. I say, you know what? I just want to give you encouragement and hope in our time and I want to hear from you what's going on in your life rather than just broad but brush you. Um, so I can give you specifics, but, but I think he adds be patient with all men there for a reason because it is going to take time and, and uh, people become irritating and, and, and some people, you know what, I've gone through a lot of Kleenex boxes in my office and uh, um, it's, it's interesting to watch because um, <sighs> you know, women, women can be very emotional and that's another reason you give them to, to women, but, um, but in odd times, that's, they're married to a man who's, who's totally not a help to them, not a spiritual leader and so uh, usually I find that out pretty quick and usually the issue is coming. Uh, you can discern attitudes or w- I find the time when you finally bring the scripture to bear or you give them homework. I had a couple come in one time and I, sa- I gave them homework. I said, here's how I work. I, g- I gave a- assignments out for you to do and-, and I'd like you to do these because we spend our time working on those. And, and they kind of, okay, I-, I really wasn't sure how to read that. And so they came back next time. Sorry, teacher, we forgot our homework. Our dog ate it. I said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, because if it happens again, I'm gonna have to terminate our counseling. But uh, I tell you what I'll do. Um, you have the assignment in front of you. I got some emails to answer. You sit there and you work on it and I'll, I'll answer emails. And you know what? That's gonna take you about the full hour. We'll see you next week after that, okay? So why don't you stay here and do your homework and, and then leave? Because I want you to know that, that and, and for them it was totally an issue of, uh, I began to see that the issues in the relationship were uh, a lot of pride. Um, and, and when I see that beginning to rear up, I, I, uh, you know, I wanna be gentle and patient with them and then force them to be the ones that say, you know, we don't want to do this. But at, at, at certain points, homework is used really effective to, to kind of unearth that. I had a lady come into me. I kid you not, guys. Um, she talked. I have, a, I have a 19-month-old. She talked a little better than her. And she was like 30. And it wasn't because she had some legitimate medical issue. She would, she would be here. She would tell you this. Um, she she kind of talk like like this and just kind of was afraid and just you you could see her countenance and the way her voice it was like this is weird and, and I said well what well what can I how can I minister to you and she said um, well at night I um, for about six hours usually each night I curl up in in the corner of my house which is all alone and I just sob I just sob 
And sometimes I, I, I fall asleep and I just don't wake up till the morning. And I don't know how long I've been there just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. She's saying to the, this to me in baby talk. And um, so despairing and so crushed. It was a week immediately. You know, I didn't want to say, well, repent, you selfish woman. Don't you understand God's sovereign in your life? You know, I don't do that. Um, and just to come alongside her, and, and I gave her some homework and tried to treat her gently in the office. She came back the next week, and she just, I mean, talking like this. Weird. I mean, weird, gentlemen. Um, just to see how, how, well, no, I mean, to talk about how the Spirit of God is able to work in the life of a person. She took that assignment, and I gave her, I didn't want to overwhelm her because I sensed that she was kind of weak in her frame. And so I, I gave her an assignment that I didn't feel would overwhelm her. Like two days later, she sent me an email, okay, I'm done with that, I'm ready to meet again. It was, it was a pretty, pretty hefty assignment. It would have taken her probably a normal person maybe a week and a half, two weeks to do. Done. I'm like, okay. All right, we can work. She, she's making major strides and all she needed was someone to bring the word of God to, to cut her loose and, and she was off and, and we didn't meet for maybe, maybe one or two more sessions before she was just, she was totally just walking. I mean, she had issues and patterns she had to deal with and she, she left under no illusion as she was moving. She left under no illusion that, that the issue was, you know, she didn't think it was gone. She knew that she had to work on this, but she developed a pattern, a way of thinking in those first couple of meetings that we really had to deal with where, where I could discern from that she was totally teachable, totally willing to work, and it was just a, it was just a good time. So, uh, thanks for that. That's kind of a long answer to that, but. Uh, the homework that you give out is this something that's pre-prepared by you? Like, you know, you got a couple of sheets that it's kind of like the first time homework, or is it something you kind of put together after you've heard the situation? It's a great question. Uh, the question is, uh, what do you do if a someone uh, do I prepare my homework ahead of time to give to certain cases? I, that. When I began, no. I mean, I had certain things that I got from Dr. Mack or Dr. Scott that were helpful that I give to a person struggling with anxiety, some of the big ones. Um, but I try to tailor the homework to the individual. Um, and, and, and it's the conviction that they change when they're at home alone with the Lord and nobody's looking except them with their nose in their Bible. Um, that that's when true change happens. So I try to emphasize that. And I tailor the homework to their situation. And sometimes in really hard cases, what I'll do is, as I'll use the first session just for, I won't try to get everything done in that session. In fact, I just want to hear them and just want to give them hope that they're in the right place. You have no idea. I mean, I've had women cry. And, just, and I'll say, you know what? I can help you. I think by the grace of God, you're in the right place. And that we can, with, with your cooperation with the Spirit of God, change. Their count is just enliven. Really? And I say, okay, come back next week. No, that's not what I say. I say, and change can happen starting right now. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to go home, and then I'll give them an assignment that's kind of uh, tailored. But oftentimes what I'll do is I'll say, you know what? And for really hard cases, I appreciate that. I'll give them hope. And I'll say, what, it would be, what would be good for me is if I could take some time to really pray about this for you and really search the scriptures and do an excellent job. Would you be okay if that, if I took maybe a week and sought the Lord and, and maybe uh, looked up some key scriptures better than I could just give you off the cuff now? I've never had anybody say no. But I'll give them some assignment that they can take with them. I've used assignments like, one of my favorite ones to use is, is give them the book of 2 Corinthians in two weeks and ask them to spend every day in 2 Corinthians and to identify, ask four questions. Um, what were the trials that Paul faced in 2 Corinthians? Um, uh, what did he learn about God, the character of God? What did he learn about the purpose of trials? And what relevance does that have to your specific situation? I, I've had people come back just, just it's almost like, that's all I needed, thanks. You know, just to, just to put them back, to give them a biblical frame of reference for their issues and work with them. Okay, so how is this face and what does this attribute of God relate to your situation? And, and so I try to tailor that. I do the same thing with Philippians. Um, I try to, that's where your exegesis comes in in your Old Testament, New Testament survey. You know, going to certain passages that you can say, well, you know, um, I'd really like you to just, just meditate on Psalm 73 this next week. And I want you to come back and tell me just if anything in your perspective has changed. And meanwhile, I'm gathering data, and I'm calling Dr. Scott, and I'm just getting all my you know, stuff together. Then when they come back, and this is the preparation that's required in between, I have done my homework and spent probably, for that Gnosticism lady, I probably spent 30 hours outside of our office just working, preparing, trying to do research and, and understand Gnosticism, write a defense, and all that stuff. And, and um, so I use homework as a way to buy me time, too. It's good. ever seek after people like, you know, I'd like to counsel you in this or follow up from one, maybe one of your messages, or maybe for some of us who aren't in full-time ministry yet, 
don't have people knocking on our door every five minutes, oh, can you counsel me, Pastor? Mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. How can you shepherd people just... Great question. How do you shepherd people, and, and, and do I ever come alongside and say, well, here are, um, I see this in your life, I'd like to counsel you sometimes. Uh, I, I, try to, I try to, two things. Number one, I try to concentrate my energies on the leadership. People who are in key areas of leadership, because I can't be all out in everybody's life, uh, it goes back to the manure thing again. You know, I'll, I'll, it'll all be clumped together and that's all I'll do, I'll burn myself out. Um, I try to invest in leaders and part of my investment in is training them to counsel, but in, invariably, this you'll find if you take any counseling classes, before you ever think about counseling somebody else, you get slapped silly. I was telling Stuart at lunch that, that one of his classes in, in seminary, I, I literally, I thought, okay, if he doesn't stop, I'm getting up and leaving. And I wasn't bitter or mad, I just was so convicted. And I said, I, I, I just can't take this anymore. Luke 5, I can't be exposed to what you are. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. And, I, and, and then he called for a bathroom break, man. I ran to that bathroom and hid under the holiness of God. And so um, it, the counseling is really to, in a lot of ways, this is preparation for your own life. But So invariably in training people to counsel, you'll counsel them that way. Um, but I, you know, this is the other conviction I have that, that I'm not a, just a professional counselor. That's not all I do. I'm also in the life of the body as a shepherd trying to know their, their heart and their needs and their issues. And, and there's times where I'll interact with a person and just through the course of, of just fellowship and one anothering, I'll, it'll unearth some issue where, I, where you know, we're talking about how to encourage or pray for each other or through, if I'm in the life context with them is where that really opens up. Not when we're sitting across the table saying, okay, here's your issues, here's verses, but to sit down in the course of life with them and actually interact and say, you know, that was interesting the way that you looked at that lady. I had a guy one time, we showed up at his work, and he was a friend of mine. We showed up at his work and uh, he was working that night and he was gonna finish up and come sit down with us and just have some fellowship. And as he walked by, he grabbed the hand of one of the waitresses in a very caressing way and walked past her. This guy's a believer in him. Whoa, what do I do with that? Oh, well, automatically I got a shepherding issue on my hand and so I sat down with him and I said, what was that? Can, I mean, can, as a brother in Christ, I mean, you're a married man, um, you know, and he was kind of defending. I said, well, would you do that if your wife was here? Oh, I wouldn't do that. And it, it come to find out that this guy had a major struggle with, with his life, with lust. And so as we tried to work together, um, we found out there were more issues. That did just, this was just the cream of the crop. So in that case, I would enter into some sort of shepherding with him or... or um, uh, but so I, as a shepherd, I want to try to be in the body all the time in the sense of body life, a real sense of Christian community, um, not just in the pulpit and not just in my office if you make an appointment, but in, I think the shepherd is always among his sheep. He knows his sheep and his sheep know him. And I think that's essential. So I, I try to, I don't want to inflict myself unnecessarily. And I don't want to, and this is the other thing that helps me is, is people, if everybody on your pastoral staff, guys, is, is committed to this, then it's not a problem because I, I'll have people that come to me and say, yeah, I got this issue. And I say, you know what, I'd be glad to help you. And maybe they've heard that I've had some training and counseling and they want specifics. So I'll meet with them once, maybe twice and say, you know what, it's really better that since you're, um, you're one of the leadership in the high school ministry, that maybe, maybe we could bring our pastor John in on this. And maybe he could kind of take you from here or you know you're in the college ministry or you know what uh you're in the senior ministry and, and i know that there's someone who's capable who will work with you on these issues i'd love to help you but it makes more sense because in a life context scenario i'm just dealing with issues that aren't met in the course of normal body life so i try to emphasize body life as much as i can and and i find that my counseling load goes down when body life goes up and just those extreme cases like maybe i mentioned to you this morning or this afternoon come 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 to me Great. How do you different, differentiate between counseling relationship and discipling relationship? Uh, uh, there's a difference, I think, but it's subtle. I, I, think, I think counseling, well, discipleship is more life on life, life context. Uh, counseling would be more of a, uh, of a formal and intentional, uh, accelerated uh, and concentrated effort. Okay, here, I want to work with this. Um, I never want to replace discipleship with it. In fact, you could call it discipleship counseling, I think. That here we are. We, our goal, if you come to me, is to, to help work with you on these issues. And discipleship was, is you know, investing in someone, helping them to obey what Christ said. So we're going to help them um, uh, with these issues, and we're going to send them back into the life of the body or plug them in with someone who's a spiritual mentor for them. So uh, you're spiritually mentoring them in counseling, but it's, a, it's in, in, in the way I operate, it's more of a, to help you meet and deal with the needs that normal body life discipleship stuff doesn't address. Uh, because maybe the person who's discipling you isn't equipped to deal with that. And so I can come in and help, but in order to plug you back into that so that discipleship is, is where the eggs are in that basket. I, I put a lot of priority on discipleship. 
And it's good. Yeah, Wayne. How do you deal with people who call in for counseling? Because that can be a mm -hmm. huge time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, people who call in for counseling. It doesn't happen that often. Um, and what I usually, what will happen typically though, if somebody does call, okay, here's the situation, they'll just spill their guts on the phone. I'll, and that gives me great room to get data. And, and even prepare before when they came in, I say, you know what, what would be better is if I could sit down across the table from you and then maybe I could hear your heart a little bit better because on the phone, you know, it's kind of distant in person. I would love to sit down. Can, is there a time that you're free maybe this week or early next week that we could, that we could sit down and talk? And, and so I, I just, I, I say, I'm willing to help you, but it would require you to come down here or some cases I'm willing to, uh, if it's a guy, I'll, I'll meet you at Starbucks or I'll meet you, you know, somewhere else for breakfast and we can work through those issues. But um, that doesn't happen a lot. Uh, more of the phone calls are, <laughs> I got a call this morning, hi, uh, I saw you have a singles ministry and would like to uh, sell you. What do you do with your premarital counseling? Do you do that in a basic overview of that? Premarital counseling. Right now, we don't do it as well as we'd like. Um, we're still in process with this. Uh, but what right now we do is each individual pastor will work with a couple and we'll, we'll try to tailor it to them uh, specifically. I know at Grace, they've, they've done more of a, uh, the instructing part in a class and then assign them a couple to work through some of the more specifics. I, I like that idea a lot. Um, we've done a lot of, what we've tried to do is we've, we've done a lot of teaching in the area of marriage and relationships. We had Stuart this last weekend at our church um, at, or at our church doing a retreat, a couples retreat, where, I mean, people came back with their bellies full and, and, and they came back and said, you know what, we are so convicted um, of, about our lives and, and then that opens up, you know, we, we need some help specifically in, in, in our marriage. But you're asking about premarital. Um, premarital, we just, the pastor who's marrying usually does the counseling. And, and, and the part I do like about that is it's very personal. I had, I had a couple, am I doing okay on time? Okay, um, I had a couple come to me that I, I had premarital counseling with and uh, I reached a point, I said, you know what guys, I, I feel like I'm a referee and I don't feel like you've progressed at all in your relationship and so I'd, I'd like to meet with each of you individually and give you my own personal feel about your relationship and things that I'd like to see you work on, premarital. And so I met with her and I said, run. As fast and as hard as you can, run. This is, uh, we've tried to make this work. I've tried to believe the best in the sense that this thing may, I, I, I'm trying to be hopeful in the Lord that this will work, but I just don't see it happening. And I think you're gonna spare yourself a world of hurt if you run. And so he comes in. I told her to run, and here's why. And I just shared with him the issues in his life, and I said, if you don't take these seriously, you're, you're gonna destroy your marriage. Okay, well, we'll think about those things. Came back two weeks later. Once you know, everything's fine, no problems. Said, well, I don't believe you. I mean, I believe that maybe you're not having conflict, but I don't believe the problem's solved. I mean, I'm not saying you're a liar. I just said, I just, I just don't theo theologically believe that's possible. I said, well, okay, well, we're gonna get married by this guy. Okay. They get married a week later after their honeymoon. They're in my office, screaming at each other. I'm like, man. And so you can only do so much, you know? And I, I, we took them through Wayne Max material on uh, uh, preparing for marriage God's way, which was really helpful. Um, uh, we've tried to give them very tailored personal stuff, especially in the area of communication. Um, uh, and, and a lot of it is unfortunately people who get starry-eyed and don't deal with their issues in marriage. And, and so part of the, shepherd, uh, uh, the singles ministry I shepherd, we just finished a series on relationships where we talked about what to look for and ask in a potential mate and so to spare yourself from some of these things. And, and I think they have a good understanding now of what marriage looks like. But Premarital, we, 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 we should do better, and we've talked recently about it, and there's, there's some resources out there that, um, uh, that different pastors use that I don't necessarily think are, are helpful, so we're trying to uniform our, our standard um, so that we're, we're thoroughly biblical, but that's in process for us, to be honest with you. Uh, just two questions connected to each other. Uh, the same uh, case you brought in, in during your introduction, the second one. Mm -hmm. um, the Gnosticism case? Yes. Mm -hmm. Having diagnosed the case, you know, you know what that person needs. Right. Uh, firstly, my question is, do you counsel such people alone or with, you know, two, three people? Okay. And second is, when you know the need, in what way that person is going to be helped? Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand your second question. You know, in what way we can help such a person? Mm, how, what would you do? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, the question is, um, uh, in the case of the Gnosticism, that lady who saw things and, and had light come in over her temple, um, in that scenario, um, what, what can we do to help her? I mean, what, what would be the ultimate uh, uh, way that we could go? Uh, the first part of your question again. You counsel alone? Or do we counsel you? alone? No, I didn't counsel her. Well, first because she's a woman. Uh, 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 and, and because she's, I, I think she has some demons. 
and because of her hostility, and primarily because I want to involve another older woman in, in, in her life anyway. So I brought that woman who, who called her out to begin with. And, and so that it was just, you know, we see these concerns, now the pastors vocalize these concerns, and so there's another voice of reason in the room. Um, do I counsel her alone? No, uh, uh, for sure. Uh, largely in her case, um, and sometimes I'll, I'll counsel a woman with my door shut. I have blinds that people walk by, but this, she was only available at night, so she came in at night. Uh, but as far as counseling people like that alone, no, I, I want another pair of ears in the room. There could be something. In fact, it was helpful because I sat down and laid out for this woman all the details of everything that she's told me and everything that she's, this woman has taught and how everything that she's taught relates to Gnosticism. And I sat down and said, do you see the connection? And she's like, I don't believe that. I said, well, this is what, I never said that. Did she say that? She said that. Well, what I meant was, and all of a sudden I had a second person in the room. That's, that's really elevating it to the next level. She, th this woman confronted her in the room and, and brought her into me. So really we had moved to a, sort of a step two in that. And so um, to bring one or more with you, or one or two with you, Jesus said in Matthew 18. So we were at that step where now her, her teaching was beginning to be leavened. It was per permeating the whole group and people were getting really uh, concerned. And so she wanted to bring into me. And so as we worked with her, we tried as hard as we could. I mean, I, I pray for that woman every day every day that she'll come back. But we had to ultimately take her to the church and then bring, this is part, second part of your question, we had to bring the rest of the body around and say, if you know her, I mean, she's not a member here, so we're not putting her out of the church because she's already out of the church, but we are um, asking you to be warned against her. And if you know her, would you please plead with her to come to the elders and to repent and recant of her doctrine? But do not listen to her. Do not engage that with her. Do not try to get into that argument with her because if she finds some unsuspecting weak person in our ministry um, and she begins to pass this on I mean it's 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 poison and so we ultimately had to protect our body but how do you deal with that person well first Corinthians 5 um, you deliver them to Satan which just means to take them out of the blessing and protection of the church with the hope that their spirit would be saved in the day of visitation I mean that the, the Lord would that would rescue them and we just pray furiously for her and uh, we're warned we, we we she appealed she threatened to sue us which was interesting. Um, she threatened to sue us, and so we said, okay, we're still gonna do what's right. And we have provisions in our bylaws if you wanna do that, but we're still gonna do what's right. Um, and uh, she tried all kinds of different things to get us out, and she appealed for meeting after meeting after meeting, and eventually we said, you know what? We've tried to say all that we can. We've talked to you, and, and she became very defensive, would never listen. I mean, we couldn't, she would interrupt and, and wouldn't uh, interact with us, and I kept saying, you know what? You have to stop interrupting me. Do you see the scripture? She wouldn't open her Bible. That's what made me concerned about demons too. When we opened the Bible, no, no, she just got off that like, like crazy. Oh, well, off of off of the Bible, we we tried. So let's open the Bible and talk about that. And she would just, she would dart from that. Did not want the Bible open. And you uh, uh, she said, "I authorized you to pray this and this and this for me." And so I said, "Okay." And then I prayed what I wanted to pray uh, <laughs> for her, that she would repent and come to the truth, the knowledge of the truth. Um, but ultimately now she's, uh, she knows the truth and ultimately it's an issue between her and the Lord and, and with the hopes that being in the world out of the blessing and protection of the church, she would be scared to death of what uh, all that's involved with and would repent. But we had a, at that point a priority to protect our people so we had to remove her and uh, tell her not to come back unless she was willing to recant and warn our people not to engage her. That's all we could do. Yeah. What's the name of the guru that you said? The guru's name is Shalanda Saima. Um, she's based out of Huntington Beach. When she's here, or she's in India. Um, Shalanda Saima. Yeah, she's she's a guru. She's uh, she's actually getting quite a following now. Interestingly, this this whole guru thing is picking up like there's a lot of momentum behind it. It's good. Just to get a feel for what's out there, what percentage of your time is spent like in couples or marital counseling, mm, and what percentage question. is spent with people who are on some sort of behavior altering medication? <laughs> That's great. A great question. Uh, depends on when you ask me, uh, really. Um, but in let me give you general statistics. Probably ninety plus percent is a marital. Ninety percent uh, plus. That the marriage and family counseling that Stuart offers, you got to take it. There's another one offered at the college called Marriage and Family Topics. That's a lot more specific on things like divorce, remarriage. By far, by far. Um, there are more people out there who are on medicine. Probably I'm dealing with one, two, three maybe four cases right now, um, where, where people are on some sort of behavior altering drug to deal with their issues. Um, but there's a lot more out there, a lot more out there. I'm dealing with a case right now of a, of a, of a kid who's been medicated since he was two. 
uh, uh, to deal with issues. He kicks holes in the wall, beats his head, takes sharpened pencil and scrapes his skin off, bleeds, uh, 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 screams, uh, uh, just, and they're thinking, what do we do with this guy? You know, for, since two years old, they've had him on medicine. So when he threw, first threw a tantrum when he was two, um, uh, they thought, they, they freaked out. And so they took him to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist says, well, he has Tourette syndrome. And so with Tourette syndrome, well, then what we need to do is give him lithium or, you know, different other thing. One, one note about lithium, by the way, um, if you have, you have somebody that's on lithium, they say you have a low lithium level. Everybody has a low lithium level. Lithium is nowhere ever produced in your body. So when they say you have a low lithium level, they're right. And so they give you lithium. What they do is they say, here, you got a problem. Here's try lithium. Works. And uh, that's what we find a lot of people, they, they don't investigate, they don't throw. So we, when we preached this series, um, I went first and kind of dealt with the medical aspect of it um, in, in my sermon at some bits. I had these people coming up to me going, okay, we got to talk because I've ha- I have a guy I'm working with right now, 20 years on lithium. And, and, and the problem is, is every year his dosage has to swell. And, and, and right now he's, um, he's been on dosages uh, that... Uh, um, they have for people who are, are, are in mental hospitals who are they're just trying to suppress. Just keep down, he's on such high levels of it because every year, the, the real issue that was in his heart was never dealt with and so it became worse and the medicine was needed to, to correct the behavior, or try, to, try to correct the behavior but not deal with the heart. And uh, I, we deal with that a lot more now. So actually what I'm trying to do is move is I'm trying to develop counselors uh, under me. I'm trying to move more into this area uh, so that I can work with people who are, the, who are in that issue. But I, I, I talk to a lot of people who either they are or know somebody who's on. I mean, I'd just be curious in here, how many of you know somebody or in your family or close related that's on uh, a, some sort of drug like that? Wow. Staggering. I was, um, you heard of oppositional defiant disorder? It's one of the new ones. If your kid throws a tantrum, rebels against authority, has ODD. It's the sequel to ADD. I, I told our people about, and it's treatable by medication. I told our people about a new, it was in Biography mi- Magazine about three months ago. There is a new psychiatric disorder that you need to be alerted to. It's called dysthymia. It's treatable by me- medication and therapy. Dysthymia is, um, uh, is the technical name for discontent. That's what the article says. Dysthymia, dealing with discontent. McFly, <laughs> discontent. And, and it says, are you frustrated? Do you feel stressed? Are you overwhelmed? You have dysthymia. It's like, no, 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 you don't. You don't. You don't need medicine. People are just, you know. I mean, uh, Jack made a good point when he was preaching. Jack Hughes is uh, our senior pastor there. Um, and he made, a, he made a good point. You know, if you go to a psychiatrist, they can't write down on their medical insurance thing to get reimbursed while he's in sin. <laughs> you know, he's got a lust that he's nurturing or petting. I mean, you just can't do that. You can't be reimbursed for that. So it's good. Church back in Huntsville, I had someone um, just in regular conversation say that they uh, had been using large doses of prescription medication mm-hmm. um, at two or three different ones for, and given them by a doctor for um, ADD type of okay. things. Had been on it for 15 years, uh-huh. something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody comes into your office and says that. And they, they're now dealing with the pastor mm-hmm. and some elders, so it's being taken care of. But as a personal friend, how do you deal with that? Mm. Well, that's good. Uh, the question is, what do you do with somebody who's even a personal friend that's been on uh, medication for like 15 years for like ADD, ADHD? Yeah, so different. Mm-hmm. D- w- tell me this, what is, their, uh, what is their conviction? Do they believe that it's wrong and they're trying to get off of it? Yeah, absolutely. And what they find is that they know exactly how to go get it. Mm. I mean, there's some sort of... Um, so it's like they're addicted to it? Or is that, is that what you're saying? Well, he would say that, yeah, it's habitual. I mean, he's mm-hmm. been doing this for so long. His body has sure. maybe a chemical dependency on it. I sure. Don't well, that's the reality of it. When you're on those d- chemicals for so often, you become dependent on them. And to go off cold turkey sends you in a spiral. I was in the ER a few months ago with a, with a brother who, was, uh, uh, who took himself off lithium and just bottomed out. I mean, I talked to him, and he, I mean, he, was, he was not registering. He was not, I mean, I talked to him, and he was just staring at me. I thought, man, this, I, can't, I can't reach this guy right now. So what do we do? Well, stay off lithium and wait for him to normalize? No, he's going to go deeper and deeper because the reason he got on the drug, and this is how I would approach it, um, the reason he got on the medication, uh, in this guy's case, who's a friend, a close friend, so I'm just making the connection there, uh, a close friend that I've developed in the course of shepherding here is in our ministry. Um, 
as we work with him, we begin to realize this guy is on drugs for 15, 20 years to deal with a, a spiritual problem that if we go off cold turkey, the spiritual problem unmet still exists. And so for some level, there's been a mercy that's been holding him back from being as bad as he possibly could. But if I'm going to go after him, I'm not going to say, you know what, you need to get off that you know, dependent medicine that you're on because you're using that as, instead of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to go there. What I'm going to do, because I'm not a medical doctor, one, I can't, I can't do that. But what I'm going to do is try to emphasize the spiritual, go after the spiritual aspect of it and encourage him towards that. And if the pastors or elders involved, that sounds like what they're going after. But I never encourage a person to get off of medication uh, because if they do, there's no spiritual safety net to catch them. And they'll just, they'll just, they'll pancake on the ground. There'll be a grease spot on the floor. And so what I try to do is come alongside them and just nurture them uh, spiritually to help build them up in their faith so that when they step off that tightrope, they step off about a foot and they have stable ground underneath them. And I just come alongside and say, you know what? The grace of God is sufficient for you. Uh, changing is a process. If, even if you're, you can be pleasing to God even if you're not perfect. And what I mean by that is the progress of sanctification is pleasing to God. And that is right. You can change today and that is honoring to him. And you should be taking the steps that your pastors and elders are giving you. And how can I pray for you specifically? When are you uniquely tempted? How can I, how can I as a brother hold you up? Those kinds of things. Um, but I'd never, I never tell anybody to get off medicine. I always tell them if they say, like that, that lady that came back to me, I should get off this. I've been going to a psychiatrist. What should I do? I say, you know, why don't you go back to the doctor who put you on them and tell them what you told me and see if they'll take you off. See if, see if they want to do that. And typically what happens is they'll say, yeah, but we need to wean you off in dosages. Um, there's studies that, uh, that I've seen that reflect that people came back from Vietnam, they were on lithium, they went off cold turkey and were fine. Um, so there's, but I don't want to subject my people to that unnecessarily, especially if they're not thinking biblically because then their last condition becomes worse than their first and they just totally crash and burn. And, and so, Can I ask a well, of course. How are you going about discovering the initial, you know, maybe root problem? I mean, what's the sin issue that needs to be addressed? In this case, um, it's just some, some major general life issues, just not okay. living um, to glorify God. Sure. Overall. Well, it would be hard to give a specific answer to that because I don't know the, I'd have to sit down and give a lot of data gathering, but I do know this based on what you said, that the purpose for which he was made was to glorify God. And if he's not doing that, he's frustrated by divine design. And so, so the steps he should be taking are to correct that, acknowledge that as sin, to deal with that. Uh, probably probably it's, it's little things like not reading his Bible, praying, not being involved in the life of the body and fellowship closely, not maybe being discipled, uh, not having a fervent, fervent confession life. And those things would relate to walking independently of God, which would be a pride issue, right? I, don't, I can do this on my own. I can control my life, and God's frustrating that. And if I'm not living the glory of God, what am I living for? You know, than, than living for the, the gratification of self. And so that's the issue. And, and that manifests itself in a number of ways. But I, 1 John, 3, or 1 John 2, uh, 16 is my, is my help to find the heart issue. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Lust of the eyes things you look at. A blind person can struggle with that too, right? Because they can have sinful gratification of their mind imaginings, right? Uh, lust of the flesh, certain physical bodily cravings or uh, boastful pride of life, some sort of self-exaltation. I know Stuart has championed <laughs> very convictingly um, the stuff on pride. And, and uh, usually it's one of those three and I take them down to that hard issue and then show them the put on attitude and then the put on behavior to what's going wrong. Usually with ADD, ADHD, you're dealing with stuff like lack of self-control. That's probably one of the big issues. Uh, unable to control themselves. I mean, maybe you're dealing with less of the flesh there. And so I, it would require a lot of data gathering, but generally speaking, that's maybe what I would do. And just to be an encouragement. So what are you learning in the word? What's God teaching? You know what he's teaching me? And just to be that kind of spiritual refreshment. So he looks at your life and says, that's what I want. I want to be like Christ. Their parents, you know, their teachers have said they have ADHD, and they're not believers. The kids aren't believers. Yet you have to deal with these problems. How can they fix the problem if they're not saved? Yeah, that's the issue. The question is, what do you do if a person's not a believer, if they're not saved, uh, and, and they are kids, you know, and, and, and they're having these issues, they're... I mean, the, ultimately, the issue is to shepherd their heart, right? So you have to, you're, you're parenting, and that's why I'm dealing with this case on Tourette's. So you have to shepherd his heart and go back to the gospel. So every, every parenting instruction is going to be to point him back to the gospel and to the Savior and to his sufficiency to deal with these issues. And if there's a sin, to remind them that there is pardon and forgiveness, but um, to never accommodate the sin or to allow it. That's what ADHD would say. Well, what you need to do instead of correcting it through discipline would be to correct it through medicine and that you'll taper the behavior. So there's an under, undercurrent of, of thwarting against biblical 
biblical authority in parenting to take the word, to bring the scripture, the authority of God to bear in their hearts uh, so that they come under, because ultimately their rebellion is, is, a, is a pride issue. It's an insurrection against the fear of God. And, and if they want to walk in his way, walk into the fear of the Lord. Uh, Proverbs 8.13 contrasts pride and the fear of God is a sort of a put off, put on. Um, I would just go after the heart and, and deal with those issues and enforce biblical discipline. And even in the case of kids who, who, whose hearts don't change, they don't become believers, obviously that's the wellspring from which it flows, but um, biblical discipline will enforce the principles insofar as you're able to, to do that. But that, that's what we do. And we, we, we would work together. I would work with the parents, for example. And, and our, our children's pastor would work with the student uh, or with, with a child or, or our student ministries, we'd, we'd connect so there's a continuity of ministry. So what they're hearing from our student ministries guy and what they're hearing from, from me are the same. Um, we have cases of that in our, in our high school right now where, where, and this is an interesting, you need to know this legally. I'm sorry if I'm taking up all your, is it, I'm okay. All right, until you, um, uh, we had a scenario where um, I was working with the parents actually in a discipline situation, it reached that fever of a pitch and we're actually restoring them this Sunday. They repented, and through the process of counseling, they've, they've grown and changed, and it's wonderful. Not done yet, but they're going. Um, their son, total rebellious. In Deuteronomy, would have been stoned. Totally would have been stoned. Rebellious, hard-hearted, un, unrepentant, unwilling. Um, that was him. And uh, um, he ran away, ran off to Texas. The last thing they heard was that he was uh, picked up for drugs in Texas. And uh, um, the social worker came and known the history of their marriage, came and, and tried to do some investigating and realized that he wasn't taking his, lithium, or his Ritalin for his ADHD that he was you know, uh, diagnosed with back in uh, you know, fifth grade or whatever. And um, the parents sat there with the social worker and the social worker said, if I find out that there's any relationship, if you authorized him to get off of his lithium, I'm going to prosecute you with the state. We're going to come after you and prosecute you. I mean, they're taking this way seriously. And they said, well, listen, well, we have a problem with that uh, because, you know, at our church, we're learning and growing that, um, that, that, that really he has a spiritual issue, his, his rebellion and is really a sin against God and his heart. And, and she said, don't, don't tell me that. She says, I've seen this before. And she said, if I find this out, you, it's over for you. We're going to take your, your son away. Um, we're going to do all these things. And, and um, Brody's in, actually in, embroiled in that one uh, right now. Um, you know, we're trying to disciple these kids. He just came back. I saw him on Sunday under control. I don't know why, but but that's kind of the issues you have to you have to deal with. Um, what do you do when they get big and out of control and lock you out of the house and, and destroy your garage and stuff like that? I mean, it's the reality we're facing right now. Did I answer that? Well, there's one more thing that uh, you all want to break, don't you? It's hot in here. Are you hot? It is hot in here. Um, one more lesson that I want to give you. It's, it's, I'm just going to state it. Two units of counseling is not enough. Two is not enough. This class, brothers, is just setting the table. It's just setting the table. Uh, I, I plead with you to, in some way, uh, involve yourself in some deeper level of counseling. If you're, if you're like Justin and you're, you're coming in uh, sort of mid uh, and you still got some units you can burn, I urge you to do them in, the, in some sort of counseling. I mean, get your exegesis courses in, do that. But, but please, I beg you to be a balanced theologian in your practical area. Um, if you're about to walk in May, uh, I would urge you to maybe look in some things like the Masters of Arts in Biblical Counseling. It's change my, changed my life, changed my marriage, changed my walk with God. Uh, and change my counseling, but I can't, and I, I know you're going to have a series of guys who are going to come in and tell you the same thing, but I can't emphasize enough how in real life context uh, this stuff is serious, and it's not, it's like Homlab, it's, it, it's not practice. These aren't, these aren't people to practice on, these are real life people with real issues, and to, and to just try things out on them is to, um, is to toy with the stewardship we have as those who are purchased by the Lamb, so maybe I could pray and then we'll dismiss you to your break, is that right? Father, thank you for the time we've been able to share. I just bless you for these men and for the training you're giving them. I pray that they would think thoroughly and deeply about their own calling and walk out of here from the seminary balanced in their education. I beg you that you would provide for them the grace in their own character to be able to be men of God who will, out of the overflow, extend grace, your grace, to people love you and we just commit these brothers to you and their future ministry and their wives that you would help them to walk with you and walk with their wives through seminary and they would yield to you a heart of wisdom having numbered their days for Christ's sake amen
Well, I hope that you benefited there from uh, one of your brothers who's uh, just a few years removed from the seat you're sitting in. And the uh, Lord's just using him mightily. And um, I think you see in, in these guys just real pastor teachers, guys that love the Lord, love his word, and love people. And uh, well, let's do this. Since uh, we have about 20 minutes, I want to start into the subject here on page 23. And when time is up, I'm going to end, and then I'll pick it up from there uh, next Wednesday and finish it. But on page 23, if you remembered last week, we talked about the macro look of a sin as it affects one's worship. And we moved in now to letter B on page 23, the micro look uh, into the heart uh, as sin affects worship. And let's just take for a minute here uh, the location, the heart, and I'm going to uh, sort of draw, in my estimation, the, it's not an artist but a view, but the heart is more between the ears than it is in your chest. I think you all have come to that uh, uh, learned position just from the scriptures, just from the Hebrew model, that the heart is more synonymous with your mind where motives and thoughts and your will and conscience are all uh, there more than a, the bowels or kidneys or affections or emotion type of thing. But in the heart, one thing that's predominant, which is on the next page, is the occupation of the heart, which is uh, worship. That is the occupation of every person's heart. When you're born, you're born a worshiper. And I think our forefathers have done very well, especially in the Puritan era, to, uh, and even back into the reformers, that all of life is sacred. All of life is worship. There is no secular and split with sacred. Not for uh, any human being. All of life is worship. And uh, we could go into what is worship. So why don't I just come over here and talk about what are some of the elements of worship. As you look into scripture, as you view um, not only pagan worship, but sacred in the sense of uh, godly worship. Some things will stand out. One is you will find sacrifice in the area of worship. Well, we all sacrifice, um, not only as a Christian, but pagans do too. And so whatever tribe you go to, and whatever country you go to, you will find the element of sacrifice. The word worship in the Hebrew first appears, do you know when? Yeah, with Abraham offering up Isaac. He was going to worship, uh, and it involves sacrifice. And you'll see that continually through the Old Testament and into the New, even as a Christian, where a living sacrifice, uh, the offering of our lips and praise as sacrifice, sacrifice is very paramount in the area of worship. You will also seek after what you worship. Uh, it's something that when... Uh, when you're not forced to speak on something or forced to seek after something, where does your heart go? Like a compass, you can take the hand and, and force it and hold it in a direction. But when you let go, where does it go? Where's north? And wherever it is, that's, that's where your heart's worshiping. It's, it's where you're forced to worship. And again, if you're forced to speak on uh, algebra because you're a math teacher, and so for four or five hours a day, you're talking about algebra, um, which wouldn't thrill my heart, but it might yours, uh, that you're forced to do that. But when it's let go, 
when it's your time and you're not forced to speak or seek at, you will seek after what you worship. You also will speak about what you worship. In Matthew 12, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What fills the heart will come out your lips. Again, maybe not when you're forced to speak on some other subject or topic. And that's another good test is what fills their speech? What fills our speech? When we're not forced to speak on something job-related, and it's great when you're in ministry, <laughs> you're speaking about Christ and the things of Christ, it's wonderful. But when you're not talking to someone about the Lord or, and it's, it's just your time, it's when you, maybe at that point, when uh, you're not in a counseling situation, when you're not preaching, where's your heart go? You know, what do you end up talking about? Another, these, these are sort of alliterated until the end. Uh, another one is you spend. And we could put in here time, energy, and money. We, we will invest in things we worship. Uh, when Jesus said, in the context of mammon, financial things, where your treasure is, there your heart is. It's investing time, energy, and money in what you worship. And so you can tell by a person's life, the more you gather information, some of these things will be very telling about what they worship. Unbelievers, they're all worshipers. And it's just who or what are they worshiping? Another one, we serve what we worship. It's interesting, at first you might choose to do something or go after something, but before long, especially if it's sinful, it begins to be your master. And that was the message that Paul gives us in Romans, that uh, <laughs> what you serve will be your master. And, sl and sin will have an enslaving aspect to it. At first, a person maybe chooses to take a drink, but it's not long till they have to take a drink. And now it's their master. Now the lust after something becomes their master. The last uh, one here, I, maybe you can come up with an S. You trust in what you worship. And let me just read Psalm 115. Uh, there's a, uh, also a cross-reference, same type of passage in Psalm 135. But Psalm 115 says this. Uh, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name. Give glory because of thy loving kindness, because of thy truth. Why should the nation say, where now is their God, but our God's in the heavens, and he does whatever he pleases? Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. And then it says, those who make them will become like them. And then it says, everyone who trusts in them. And then the admonition for Israel is, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. And uh, so there's an element of trust that this will give me what I want. Whatever I worship, it will give me what I want. It will give me what I need. My hope will be in whatever I worship. And it, I find it interesting on verse 8 when it says, those who make them will become like them. That's an interesting little comment there, isn't it? Inspired word of God there. 
those who make them become like them. I don't know if you've ever dealt with someone who's enslaved, absolutely enslaved to a particular lust. But you can talk to them and say, don't you see what you're doing to your family? Nope. Don't you hear what people are saying to you? Nope. It's just like these idols. They have eyes, they cannot see, they have ears, they cannot hear. You make them and worship them, you become like them. You're dead and blind at noonday. And it's, it has that effect, the, the worship process. And Psalm 135 is very similar. So this is the aspect here of worship. Uh, every human being is a worshiper. Uh, who sacrifices, seeks after, speaks about, spends time, energy, money, serves whatever they worship and trusts and hopes in what they worship. <clears throat> now, Romans chapter 1, I think you all are familiar, very familiar with this particular passage that tells us uh, in verse 24, I'm just going to pick up at that passage there talking about the wrath of God is revealed from heaven and exchanging the glory of the incorruptible God for the imaging form of corruptible man. And verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And so you have this, this whole concept here, this whole theme. You could call it one of the major threads of the tapestry, of the biblical tapestry, is worship. It's, it's about worship. Uh, before eternity, I mean before time, I should say, and on past time. It's all about worshiping our God. He created Adam and Eve to worship. He walked with them in a worshipful relationship. They sinned, it broke worship. Uh, they started, from there on, uh, people began in Romans here refusing to worship the Creator and instead would find something about themselves to worship instead. And that is at the very core of a worshiper is self. For a pagan individual, it is all about living for self. And that's why the gospel, when it's in a uh, condensed uh, there in 2 Corinthians 5, that Christ died for all, in verse 15, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died, was buried, and rose again on their behalf. So it's, it's about self, self-focus. You want to save your life, you will lose it. And so self-worshippers, uh, you can see it in Romans. When you look in John chapter 4, you find Jesus with the woman at the well. I'm sort of setting the scene here for uh, next week. But John chapter 4, when Jesus is speaking about worship, since she brought up the topic, he starts talking about worship and he says down in verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. It's the Father who's seeking, and he's seeking worshipers who will now have a change to worship him in spirit and in truth through a whole new birth. Worship is not an uncommon thing with unbelievers. That's the preoccupation of their heart. And you could say that the heart has always been a temple. 
It's a very religious place, the heart, vocationally. But when God gives a new heart and he takes the heart of stone, makes it a heart of flesh, when he regenerates, draws, and saves an individual, now that temple becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6. It's not like a, a believer now goes, oh, worship, what is that all about? We've been doing that ever since we've been born. The little tantrums, you know, that Justin mentioned, what is a tantrum? That's a little worshiper not getting his way. And it, it's all about, I must have, I need, uh, for me to live is, you fill in the blank. And it's not Christ for an unbeliever, but you just fill in the blank. For me to live is, and I ask people that question sometimes when they don't know Philippians very well. <laughs> For you to live is, and they go, boy, that's a good question. For me to live is. And, uh, hmm, I look at each other. Hmm, what do you think? You know, for me to live, probably family. Yeah, I think that's it, family. For me to live is family. Well, there, there you, there's a good idol. Uh, you follow that? I mean, it's, it's very, uh, worship is not uncommon because we're all worshipers. And, uh. And so we get into this occupation of worship. We'll find that an unbeliever has been a worshiper all their life. And it's all about these elements here. And this is the root. Everything comes out of here. Out of this heart. Proverbs 4, 23. You know, guard that heart in the Hebrew. You know, above all else, it says. Guard that heart, for from out of it flow all of the issues of life. So when you're asking questions, you know, what about this situation in this person's life? And what do you do in this kind of situation? And what about that one? And you're talking about external issues going on. We really can't tell until you find out more what's going on in the heart. Uh, my, my brother's uh, a physician, and he just... He will not answer questions when he's asked, um, you know, what do you think, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hurting here, or, you know, different people will come up to him, and, oh, I'm aching here, and uh, my mother has this. He will not answer. I mean, one, lawsuits. But another one is, there's no way to know unless you bring him in and we do some examination. Um, and you almost have to hold back even as... Um, those in ministry, people say, well, what about this? And what about that? Uh, this issue's going on out here. This issue's, what's going on? I don't know. Until we, and you hear Justin say that, it's a case-by-case -case situation. You can't, there's no cookie cutter on people. But one thing we do know, the heart is a worship place. It's a temple of worship, whether they're a pagan or a Christian. And we've got to find out in one-on-one, -on -one, in their life, what's going on as best as we can determine. And then deal with the external issues. Plus you have a physical spiritual issue that might be uh, involved in this one as well. And so you might have to definitely have the, the physicians dealing with a, a physical, a known physical issue, or at least checking that out. And so you can't just answer real fast, what about this situation? So I just wanted to bring us up in the, the time we have to the occupation of, of worship. And I want you to just linger on that. The, the biblical word is meditate. Meditate on the fact that you are a worshiper. And again, you, if you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are uh, you are a true worshiper, one who worships in spirit and in truth. But every person around you is a worshiper. If you're married, your spouse, if you have children, your children, people you work with, they're all worshipers. And it's very, I mean, you talk about sacred 24 7. It's all about worship. And so linger on that, meditate on that, and next week we want to go into the whole topic of 
what's going on in, in this worship arena in the heart when you're talking about counseling. All right, well, let me close in prayer. And uh, I think I have all of the, the rest of the PM, 7-Eleven uh, field study things here. All right, let's pray. Father, we do uh, want to praise you and thank you uh, for setting your love on us. Thank you that you chose us and drew us unto yourself because we didn't seek after you. We didn't first love you. You first loved us. And Lord, I pray that you might increase our worship of you even this week. Lord, help us to look through the eyes of, of your word at people, that they're all worshipers, our children, our spouses, our brothers and sisters, all of the people that we see are all worshipers. And I pray, Lord, that we might be faithful in giving them the good news of Jesus Christ, those who are lost that you might have mercy on their life and draw them to yourself. Lord, bless each one here. Encourage them as they're studying your word to help them to worship you in truth. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.